Some players perform the impossible on a pitch, but what if I told you that Stoichkov was the main character of the greatest comeback of all time? And what if I told you that comeback happened twice in a row, maybe even three times? The odds of these events were out of this world. Stoichkov was insane in pretty much every sense of the word. This is easily one of the most impressive stories I've ever heard and that I've ever told on this channel. You should definitely stick around, so let's get into it. In the words of Stoichkov himself, in his childhood, there were only two paths for him. He would either become a football player or a gangster. Though to be fair, in Bulgaria, those two worlds weren't as different as you might expect. A quick search will lead you to finding that Bulgaria is known as the murder capital of football. In this country, corruption and gang activity are deeply intertwined with football. Once I read an article claiming that being a club president in Bulgaria could easily be the most dangerous job in the world. On a Monday morning in 2007, Alexander Tazev, president of Lokomotiv Plovdiv, sat in his car waiting to be chauffeured to work. Another car pulls up beside him, rolls down its window and Tazev is shot down, bullets flying all over the place. As the news came on TV, no Bulgarian was surprised. This was the 15th Bulgarian club president to be murdered over the last 12 years. Turns out Tazev's only hobby wasn't football. He also enjoyed drug trafficking and illegal exports of gas. Actually, even the way he became president was odd. You see, he had been interested in taking over the club for a while as he even helped ex-president Pavlov towards the goal of qualifying to the UEFA Cup. The thing is, the day they finally qualified, Pavlov was shot two times in the back of the head, execution style, in a Black Sea resort, opening up the spot for Tazev. What a great coincidence. But getting back to Stoichkov. Back then things were a bit more on the down low. There was no Wikileaks, the stadiums were still full and the general population was yet to realize how common match fixing was in Bulgaria. Reading about Stoichkov's childhood was disappointing at times. Not much is known besides the fact that he was a ball boy at his father's matches who was a goalie for a local team. But eventually, I felt a bit suspicious of how little Stoichkov has said about his parents and that's when I found this. Recently, Stoichkov's parents have come to the press claiming he's not their son anymore, that they don't even want him at their funeral. Apparently, it's been 30 years since he saw them last and they resent him for living a life of luxury. I quote, Look at my scruffy clothes. While he is covered in jewelry from head to toe like a Christmas tree, said his mother. But it's more complex than that. His brother says that no one is 100% right in the situation and sources close to the players say he only turned his back on them because they kept on trying to milk him for cash. Yeah, not the happiest family, but once again, moving on. In 1977, at 11 years of age, Stoichkov joined his first youth team, Maritza Plovdiv. He was there for four seasons and at some point, he went through what he called one of the most difficult moments of his life. A coach told him he was a player without prospects, that it was time to let go of the dream. Stoichkov, as of course he would, decided not to listen, and thank God he did. Soon another coach would see his brilliance and at only 16 years of age, he would start playing for Ebros Armanli in the third tier of Bulgarian football. From here on out his rise was steady. In his second season at the club he averaged a goal every other game and by the age of 18, CSKA Sofia, the biggest club in the country, decided to take him under their wing. Upon arrival, Stoichkov was already known for his short temper. Anyone could predict that his behavior would lead to some consequences, but no one could have guessed how punishing they would be. CSKA would meet Levski, their biggest rivals, in the Bulgarian Cup final and sometime in the middle of the match a brawl would start with players going all out, one even trying to choke someone. After the match, the Bulgarian Communist Party, afraid for the image of the country, decided to forcefully terminate both clubs and to ban several players for life. And yes, among them was Risto Stoichkov. If it sucked to be told that he wouldn't make it as a footballer, I imagine this was much worse. But thankfully, after an appeal he would only be out for a year and the clubs would be reinstated under different names, eventually being allowed to revert back in 1988. After his ban, he kept on progressing for two seasons, becoming a Bulgarian champion for the first time and eventually breaking through in 1987-1988, finishing the year with 24 goals in 31 matches, though CSKA failed to win the title. From here on out, Stoichkov was the star of the team and his only goal was to make them champions once again. On his second try, he scored 38 goals in 42 matches, but still, 
his effort seemed futile, only winning the Bulgarian Cup. So he pushed even further and the third time was the charm. Stoichkov achieved the incredible tally of 48 goals in just 40 matches, returning the title to Sofia after three failed seasons and showing the world that Bulgaria had a new king and he was looking to conquer the rest of Europe. His incredible numbers had led him to win the European Golden Boot, which he would have to share with Hugo Sanchez, who had just led Real Madrid to their fifth title in a row and won his fifth top scorer award, completely flipping the script and restoring Madrid's dominance from the moment he set foot in the club. At this very moment, Johan Cruyff was looking for a player who could take on Hugo Sanchez and deliver that same sort of goal-scoring power to Barcelona. So seeing all of this added to Stoichkov's incredible performance two years prior in the Cup Winners' Cup, scoring seven goals in eight games, including three against Barcelona, Cruyff just had to bring him in, laying the groundwork for what one day would be known as his dream team. With Kaman already in the squad, Cruyff signed not only Stoichkov but also Laudrup. Things were getting really serious in Spain. Despite scoring in all of his first three games, Stoichkov's numbers dropped substantially at first, but it would get much worse as he played his first El Clásico in December. A few minutes before the halftime break, Stoichkov would ask for a foul after being tackled, but the referee would decide none should be awarded. This led Cruyff to jump out of the bench and start yelling at him that he was being biased towards Madrid, to which the referee very promptly sent Cruyff off. Stoichkov didn't like this one bit and decided to show Catalonia why he was known as a loose cannon in Bulgaria. Area, by approaching the referee, yelling at him that he didn't know what he was doing, but this wasn't enough for Stoichkov, so the moment he noticed he was being ignored, he put his foot down. Like, literally, he sunk his studs into the referee's foot, the poor guy just stumbled to the side yelling in pain, before sending Stoichkov off as well. And once the game was over, Stoichkov would be presented with a two-month ban. What a lovely way to start your El Clasico legacy. By the time he was back for the second half of the season, it seems Stoichkov put all his energy towards something else other than assaulting referees, because over his first five matches back, he scored 10 goals, one of them against Dinamo Kiev, proving essential for their qualification to the next stage of the Cup Winners' Cup. They were now in the semi-finals and they would have to face Baggio's Juventus, which happened to be the only player who had scored more goals than Stoichkov in this competition so far. But this time around, Stoichkov took the lead, scoring two versus Baggio's only goal and getting Barcelona to the final. Unfortunately, Stoichkov would miss it through injury and Barcelona would lose it to Manchester United. Domestically, they would finish the season by winning the league again, and though Stoichkov's 14 goals couldn't hold a candle to Hugo Sanchez's previous achievements, the Mexican had missed most of the second half of the season, opening the way for Stoichkov to take all the glory for himself. Once all of this was over, we would get to the defining season for Cruyff's dream team, the 1991-1992 season. Back then, the European Cup was divided into two groups and the two teams who topped them would get to face each other in the final. Over the group stage, Stoichkov would provide Barcelona with four goals in four matches, being rested for both matches against Sparta Prague. As they went into the final, Stoichkov was easily the name to look out for. His name seemed destined to be on the score sheet. Barcelona, oddly enough, faced Sampdoria, who were witnessing their prime with players like Gianluca Valli and Roberto Mancini up front. Regardless of expectations, what we got was a long game with some incredible goalkeeping that ended only as Ronald Koeman scored in extra time through an incredible free kick as only he could. Though he failed to leave his mark in the final, the Bulgarian Raging Bull had been incredible throughout the tournament and somehow his performances at the European level weren't even the most exciting. Back in Spain, Hugo Sanchez was pretty much out of the picture, which left Real Madrid severely weakened and seemingly offering Barcelona the chance to revalidate their title. But reality would be much different, Real would be on top of the table all the way until the last match day, leading by a single point. Barcelona would have a tough time facing Athletic Bilbao and Real would get only Tenerife, who spent the vast majority of their history in the second division. It could be argued that the title might as well have been handed to Real Madrid, especially as they already led by two by the 28th minute. The broadcast went back and forth between both matches and in the 36th minute both score sheets changed. Tenerife pulled one back and Stoichkov put Barcelona in front. By the 49th, Stoichkov had doubled Barcelona's lead, but Real Madrid had also scored their third. It would have been game over had the referee not disallowed the goal due to it being offside. 
The 63rd minute brought a game changer, Real Madrid were down to 10 men and Tenerife fighting relegation at the opportunity of a lifetime. They kept going and by the 77th minute Real saw a known goal level the match and before they even had time to complain about their tough luck, Tenerife had scored. No more changes would be seen and Barcelona would take the title as Toyshkov took upon himself to bring down Bilbao. They were champions for the second year in a row, something that hadn't happened since 1960. At this point it would be easy to presume that Stoichkov was the main candidate for the Ballon d'Or, but there was another name in contention that was hard to overlook, Marco van Basten. Still, surely with a good start to the following season, Stoichkov would be set to win it, right? Well, Stoichkov scored 17 goals in 19 matches before the Ballon d'Or voting came around and still he lost by one of the smallest margins ever seen, only 18 points. For comparison, the previous year, Papa had won it by a margin of 99 points. The winner was of course Marco van Basten, who, even though he lacked the titles and blockbuster moments Toyshkov had had that season, had been on a 55 game and beaten streak and had perhaps the voters sympathy on his side as he had recently been through an injury that would put his career to an end at the age of only 28. Though these claims are at most unsubstantiated and serve in no way to put down the legacy of Van Basten, still, trust me, there was time for Stoichkov to get himself the award. Over the rest of the season, one of the highlights was Barcelona winning the European Super Cup with Stoichkov scoring one of the goals, but would you believe me if I told you that it happened all over again? On the last match day of the season, Real Madrid was once again one point in front of them. Barcelona played Real Sociedad and Real Madrid played none else than the mighty Tenerife once again. By the 13th minute, Tenerife was already in front and Stoichkov had scored. The results wouldn't change except for yet another Tenerife goal and by the end, Tenerife had once again destroyed every Madridista's dream and given Barcelona the title in the last match day of the season. It was the first time in their history they won it three times in a row. How am I supposed to believe this wasn't scripted? One of the most incredible comebacks I've ever seen not only happened twice, but twice in a row? <laughs> The following year came the 1993-1994 season and though Romario joined the team, over the first half it's not that Stoichkov was bad but he wasn't blowing anyone's mind. But that only makes it more impressive once I tell you that 1994 was easily the best year of his career. Hear me out, in February he got a red card against Bilbao and that must have set something off in his brain because from then till the end of the season he played 19 matches and scored 17 goals including yet another incredible performance for yet another incredible comeback in the last match day of the season. Once again Barcelona was in second place, one point behind, you guessed it, Deportivo de la Coruña. I know, really obvious right? Deportivo played Valencia and Barcelona played Sevilla. The first match ended in a goalless draw but the second was far more interesting. Barcelona went behind twice and Stoichkov scored to get them back up on top twice. Someone really needs to study this man because his ability to show up when needed the most is something else. Regardless, once the match was tied again, goals by Baquero, Romario and Laudrup made sure Barcelona were champions for the fourth time in a row. In the Champions League, Stoichkov had been exceptional once again, being involved in 8 goals in the 4 matches that preceded the final. Once there, they would meet AC Milan and I've mentioned this match quite a few times but regardless, the Dream Team faced perhaps the only team in Europe that was deemed to be on their level. Laudrup was dropped in favor of Koeman, Romario and Stoichkov as only 3 foreigners could play and without him things looked very different. Not to say that his absence was all there was to it but AC Milan won 4-0 in a match that is still to this day one of Barcelona's greatest embarrassments. It was the kind of result that could put this incredible year in jeopardy when it came to the award ceremonies but to Stoichkov's luck, Bulgaria had just qualified to the World Cup. Well, more because of Stoichkov than to Stoichkov's luck, after all, he scored more goals than any other player in the squad, thanks to him they managed to knock out France in the qualifying stages of the World Cup. Go look it up, that doesn't happen very often. Regardless, the first match wouldn't be the most hopeful, a 3-0 defeat to Nigeria, things weren't looking good at all. 
but I guess it was just an upset because from here on out they beat Greece 4-0 with Stoichkov getting two goals, then Argentina who had just lost Maradona to doping claims with Stoichkov getting another goal, then came the knockout stage and then Stoichkov scored their only goal against Mexico, eventually going through on penalties. In the quarters they went behind against Germany but Stoichkov didn't shy away from tying the match and so Bulgaria eventually went in front and made it to the semi-finals. This match brought us Bulgaria versus Italy, Stoichkov versus Baggio, easily the two standout players of this World Cup. Before the match, Saki was asked how he would stop Stoichkov. His answer was quite simple. He said, perhaps stopping him with a pistol is the only way. Ironic considering Stoichkov was known as the gunslinger in Spain. Regardless, soon into the match, Baggio scored twice in 5 minutes, Stoichkov still pulled one back and even though the second half would bring great controversy with the referee supposedly failing to call out a handball by Costa Curta inside the penalty area and with Stoichkov having to be subbed off due to injury, it just wasn't enough. Bulgaria, whose best run in a World Cup had been making it to the last 16 round despite losing two matches and drawing the other two, was out in the semi-finals, being just one goal short of a shot at the title. Over this World Cup, the Bulgarians had frequently used the motto that God is Bulgarian, but after the match, Stoichkov made sure to say that though he believes God is still Bulgarian, clearly the referee was French. Still to this day, Stoichkov says that he would spit in the face of that referee if he met him again. The third place match would end in a 4-0 defeat to Sweden, still, Stoichkov had scored 6 goals in the 6 matches up till the semi-finals, winning the Golden Boot and presenting us with one of the all-time greatest international performances. Oddly enough, the last few months of the year would provide us with Stoichkov's last world-class performances. The first two matches of the season would be both legs of the Spanish Super Cup and Stoichkov would get 3 goals and a red card as Barcelona won 6-5 on aggregate. Up until November, Stoichkov scored 12 goals in 14 matches including goals against Valencia, Atletico and two against Manchester United in the Champions League. From here on out his goal scoring became drastically less frequent but still by December he would be awarded the Ballon d'Or with a massive lead of 74 points ahead of Baggio. Had Baggio not missed his penalty in the final of the World Cup perhaps Stoichkov would have ended his career without the award. I guess that's a positive way to look at Baggio's tragedy. Upon receiving the award, Stoichkov famously said, There are only two Christs. One plays in Barcelona, the other is in heaven. This kind of Zlatan-esque quote was not a rarity for Stoichkov, whose ego was just as impressive as his skills on the pitch. Though, to be fair, Risto, his first name, supposedly means Christ in Bulgarian. I mean, I don't speak Bulgarian, of course, but I, I've seen that online quite a bit. Over the last 7 months of the season, Stoichkov only scored 5 goals, missing several matches over the month of January. I think it's safe to assume the injury which saw him come off early in the last 2 matches of the World Cup had gotten the best of him. Now with Stoichkov struggling and Laudrup gone, Barcelona finally failed to win the league and by the end of the year, Stoichkov sailed off to Italy, joining Parma. This deal was only made possible as the Tanzi family who owned Parma convinced Inter to stay out of the race by selling them Roberto Carlos from Palmeiras, another club they also partially owned. This deal was awful for every side involved. Roberto Carlos didn't quite make it at Inter and Stoichkov felt unhappy with the rigidity of Italian football. He was constantly injured and only managed 7 goals in his time there. Without him, Cruyff was sacked after one season and Bobby Robson took over, bringing Stoichkov back to Barcelona as he believed they needed a leader. Stoichkov did not even get close to the numbers he used to provide, but the fact is that over his one and a half seasons there, they won the Copa del Rey, the Cup Winners' Cup and the European Super Cup. So. That is certainly something. From here on out he had a half season back with CSKA Sofia playing only 4 matches, then a 2 match contract with Al Nasser where he was supposed to help them win the Asian Cup Winners Cup, which of course he did, earning a penalty and assisting the winning goal in the first match and then scoring the only goal in the second one. What followed was 2 years in Japan and 4 years in the United States where he won his last title, the US Open Cup, scoring in the final. Actually, fun fact, Chicago Fire also signed George Weah in the same transfer window as Toyshkov, making them, I think, the only other club besides Real Madrid to sign two Ballon d'Or winners in the same transfer window. And another fun fact, I once read an article that said, referring to Stoichkov of course, that the Chicago Fire Stadium was the only place in Chicago with someone meaner than the iconic gangster Al Capone. 
Stoichkov retired as easily the greatest Bulgarian to grace the game, scoring over 300 goals and winning 23 titles. He is one of Barcelona's biggest ever legends. I recently had the pleasure of visiting the Camp Nou Museum and being just a few inches away from the Ballon d'Or 1 in 1994 was part of what led me to make this video. Here's a picture I took of it and yeah. That's it, I hope nobody really noticed that I was sick while making this video, that's why my voice sounds kind of weird, but regardless don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next week, bye!